Welcome to you all in Portugal and around the world. I am Ramon O'Callaghan, and this is the Dean's Lounge, an initiative of Porto Business School. The Dean's Lounge is meant as a forum for reflection where the Dean and the Associate Dean of Porto Business School invite distinguished scholars, experts, deans, and other colleagues from business schools around the world to discuss from different perspectives issues that are relevant for business, government, the economy, and society. As we consider the scale of change that the coronavirus has generated and will continue to generate in the weeks and months ahead, we feel compelled to reflect not just on the immensity of the health crisis, but also on the restructuring of the global economic order. How exactly this crisis evolves remains to be seen. But a shock of this scale will create a discontinuous shift in the preferences and the expectations of individuals as citizens, as employees, as, as consumer, and as consumers. These shifts and their impact on how we live, how we work, and how we use technology will emerge more clearly over the weeks and months ahead. Where are we going to be in six months, in one year, in five years, or even in 10 years from now. There are a number of possible futures, and it will all depend on how governments and society respond to the coronavirus and its economic aftermath. Hopefully, we will use this crisis to rebuild, produce something better and more humane, but perhaps we will slide into something worse. I don't know. To reflect on these issues today, we have invited Sumitra Dutta, Sumitra Dutta has a long and distinguished academic career. He's currently a professor of management and the former dean at the College Business of Cornell University in New York. He's the founder of the Global Innovation Index, published by the World Intellectual Property Organization, and was the co-editor of the Global Information Technology Report, published by the World Economic Forum. These are two influential reports in technology and innovation policy. He's currently chair of the board of directors of the Global Business School Network, a Washington DC based non-for-profit organization that focuses on improving management capacity in emerging markets. And I must say that we, Porto Business School, have joined this organization as well. We are one of the members. Sumitra was previously the chair of AACSB, the leading global body for accreditation of business schools. In addition, he is a member of advisory boards of several schools, including our own Porto Business School. Earlier in his career, he spent many years in Europe at INSEAD Business School as professor of technology management and at some point, dean of executive education. Sumitra is also a member of the Davos Circle, which is an association of longtime participants in the annual Davos meeting of the World Economic Forum and has engaged in a number of initiatives to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. He was the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Innovation Ecosystems. And he's also the chief academic advisor to the Artificial Intelligence Forum of the Confederation of Indian Industry. He received a bachelor degree in electrical engineering and computer science from the Indian Institute of Management in New Delhi and a master's degree in both business administration and computer, computer science, as well as a PhD in computer science from the University of California at Berkeley. Hello, Sumitra, and uh, welcome to the Dean's Lounge of Porto Business School. This was a long introduction, but I Hello, hope we will, <laughs> we will, we will uh, very soon get to, to, to the questions. Um, this is, uh, decided to do that in a form of, of, of a dialogue, but obviously uh, we invited you, so we want to hear more from you than from me. But let me start by asking a general question. Now, as a result of this fight against uh, COVID-19 mm -hmm. that we are, we are experiencing now major shifts in the way we live our lives. Some experts say that this is something that's here to stay, and not only in our lives, but also the beginning of something major, a restructuring of the global economic order, as some people uh, mention it. Uh, are we really at a global turning point? Are we seeing the end of globalization as we have known it? I suppose that this is a multifaceted question and has answers depending on which 
uh, you know, perspective you want to take, government, business, society. But what do you, let's get started. What are your views on, on, on this general question? So thank you very much, uh, Ramon. It's a pleasure to be invited to this forum, as I said earlier. I've had the pleasure of knowing Dean O'Callaghan for many years, and I've enjoyed working with him in different occasions. I've also had the pleasure and the honor of being invited to the advisory board of uh, Porto Business School. And uh, you know, most of your alumni of Porto Business School is a beautiful location, a wonderful school, and congratulations to all of you also. I am now taking part in this seminar from upstate New York uh, in a small town called Ithaca. That's where Cornell University's home sort of campus is located. Uh, but Cornell also has a campus in New York City. And I was uh, living and teaching a course out there till about two and a half weeks ago. And I essentially left New York City and came to Ithaca because uh, New York City started getting all these uh, cases of COVID-19. And today, as you read in the press, New York City is really the epicenter of this whole COVID crisis in the USA. Uh, much of the scenarios around COVID-19 in the USA and many other parts of the world, including in Europe, for example, countries like Italy and Spain, uh, remain, let's say, still uh, in progress. Uh, you know, there are a lot of concerns about the future progress. Uh, there are very strong restrictions that have been put in place, as many of us have read, about movement, shelter at home, you know, conditions in terms of going out of the house. Uh, my wife is from Spain and, you know, her brothers tell us that uh, to even get out of the house for a short walk or a short, uh, uh, let's say, just to, you know, buy some groceries is actually a challenge. You, you, you can be challenged and, you know, and, and questioned by the police. And all of this is happening in the best interest of society. So this is something that governments have put in place. And the global let's say a lockdown of about half the world's population that is actually in progress right now, if you include India as being part of that equation, uh, it's quite remarkable. You know, we have never seen something like this happen in history, at least in our living history. And it's not clear, and I hope that we will not see something like this happen once again. Uh, there are lots of urgent questions that are being addressed right now. You know, governments are very concerned about uh, the state of public health, the infrastructure, can you know, doctors and nurses keep up with it? And our thanks go to all the doctors and nurses on the forefront of this crisis. Uh, lots of questions about how businesses will cope, especially small businesses with all the shelter at home and stay at home kind of policies. Uh, lots of questions about how will economy, in fact, uh, you know, react to this um, what some people are saying is the great cessation, the cessation for stoppage of activity. So the great cessation is happening right now. How will we actually come out of this? Uh, the stock market obviously around the world have uh, reacted quite negatively and a lot of uncertainty about what actually will happen in the next three to six months. So, you know, we can spend a lot of time talking about what can happen in the next three to six months. Um, a lot of that depends upon what happens biologically to the virus and how it mutates and how, you know, whether or not we have a vaccine that produces it. Uh, some people raise questions about the fact that, uh, you know, even though some people estimate that in America or in Europe, the virus will peak sometime in end April or early May, uh, people expecting that this will be the end of the story. It's not completely clear. Uh, it may come back a second wave in the fall. Uh, in the Spanish flu, which happened <clears throat> about 100 years ago, uh, the most uh, dangerous and the most lethal phase was the second time it actually came back, the second phase of the Spanish flu. So, you know, a lot of questions remain unresolved around the virus and what may happen. But I think at the same time, as we struggle to deal with today, uh, it's very important for us to start thinking about the future. And I guess this is the main focus you know, of the discussion today of trying to take a hat or trying to take a perspective beyond the next six months or beyond the next uh, one year and asking the question, is something going to be different? Uh, what are some of the dimensions of change that we might actually uh, experience? And what kind of leadership is required right now you know, from business leaders, from government leaders and so on? 
I don't claim to have the answers to these questions, but what I can tell you is that I'm thinking about these questions along with, I'm sure many of you, uh, at the Global Business School Network, which I'm the chair of right now, and Porto Business School is a member of that, uh, we are doing a global study of trying to understand the reactions of business leaders and business school deans about what they think where the future will be. And we intend to publish the results on the website of the GBS and network, and also in a book by itself. So I've been thinking about this topic and hearing about it from different leaders. And what I can tell you is that based on my own perceptions and my own uh, interactions with others, I do believe that uh, this time we are really in the midst of a major change process. Uh, the change process is being triggered by a biological phenomenon, but certainly it is causing us to think and rethink some key aspects of how we have organized ourselves you know, politically, how we've organized ourselves from a business point of view and how even we function as society. So if you just take from a government point of view, clearly what you see happening out here is the need for global coordination is so apparent. You know, you're seeing right, right now that uh, different countries are putting in place different policies at different moments in time with different de degrees of you know, restrictions. And we all realize that such an approach is probably not going to lead to us collectively getting out of this crisis because the virus, if it stays the same way as it is, and if no vaccine is discovered in the relative time, short time period, transmits very easily as we have read. And just because one country you know, takes a, as a precaution and another one does not, doesn't necessarily help us. And you know, a very good case in point is in Europe right now. Uh, the European Union should be, in fact, taking a leadership in helping settle and decide what is European strategy for its, you know, uh, co combating the virus. And I don't think that really has been put in place. Different countries in Europe even today have different policies uh, to different degrees. And on a global scale, uh, certainly the leadership of the U.S. traditionally has been very important. And the U.S. was a country that led in many ways the global response and the US really hasn't stepped up to its uh, traditional roles. So what you see is that even globally, uh, there's a lack, there's a vacuum of that political leadership, political vacuum in terms of uh, collective action. And I think that's an issue for us to think about because this is not the last global crisis we will face. Uh, there are many global aspects that are affecting multiple countries. Uh, migration, for example, is another one. You know. People migrate because of poverty, because of lack of water, because of lack of food. And a lot of the issues cannot necessarily be isolated within one country in one continent. Uh, they affect us all. And how do we, how do our political leaders realize this collective need for action is very important. Uh, how do they organize themselves to take the collective action is very important. And perhaps in the absence of a clear political leader, or in the case of emergence of a new political leader, in this case, of course, being China and compared to the US, uh, how do the global coordination dynamics actually work in the future? So I think there are a number of interesting questions that uh, need to be addressed uh, from a global coordination point of view. Another very important uh, element that is becoming very important, sort of apparent from a political point of view, is the degree of control that governments exercise on their citizens. Uh, we hear of numerous technology enabled uh, mechanisms by which uh, you know, China and South Korea have really built apps that monitor the presence of people in different locations that reward them or punish them based on the movements, uh, based on certain kind of you know, uh, analysis of their purchase behavior and so on. Um, and a lot of that is justified on the basis of public health. Now, what we have seen historically is that whenever governments have taken on that kind of power, uh, they have not been quick in, rel in relinquishing that power. So they've always sort of kept that power. Uh, the closest and the most visible example of that is what has happened in the last two decades since 9-11 and the rise of and terrorism activities in many parts of the world, governments have in fact increased the amount of control they have over citizens 
in the name of protection against terrorism. And now what we might see a second wave of more control exercised by the government on citizens in the name of public health. So the whole question about how this invasion of privacy, the degree of control of citizens by governments, the whole uh, authority of governments. I think these are interesting questions that will come to the forefront and we'll have to as society deal with these issues in a reasonable and, and, and a consistent manner. Uh, you know, I can talk about many other issues uh, around business. If you'd like me to, I can go. If you want to stop sure. on this, well, this topic. I think, I think you have lined, uh, you know, just talking about governments, two trade-offs or that are important to one privacy between surveillance of citizens the other one, uh, which you touch upon briefly, is the balance between economics and healthcare. I mean, it's clear that this crisis is putting a lot of uh, the lockdown, uh, a lot of pressure on the global economy. And this pressure has led to some world leaders to call for an easing of the lockdown measures. In fact, as you know, some countries like Sweden and initially the US didn't believe in these lockdown measures and the UK as well. Um, and, and you see the trade off between, you know, what is more important, the economy or, or, or the health of the individuals? Is it, you know, what do you put in the balance? At some point, we know some people are going to die anyway. And at the other hand, you say, well, we cannot shut down the economy forever. So these are very difficult choices. So in, 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 in normal economies, what, what the government does is, you know, with their economic crisis, the, the, the classic ones, the government starts spending and spending until people start consuming and working again, and, and, and that pumps up the economy. So here, what you are, they're asking you to do is stay at home, don't work, because this is the, the opposite of what. So there's no the economy is never going to work if we have to stay at home. So and and that creates huge dilemmas, I suppose. And and a recent study that I have heard of indicates that lifting the lockdown in the Wuhan province, which is the first one to seems to be free, free from, from the virus, in doing it too soon, as we are beginning to get signals of, China could experience a second peak of cases later in the year. And like China, the rest of the world, since there is no vaccine. So this is a very dangerous and you know uncertain situation, right? No, you, you, you put the finger on the sort of issue directly, you know, I think uh, it raises some fundamental questions about uh, what is, in fact, the measure of progress. You know, traditionally, we have used GDP as the measure of progress of an economy. And the health of an economy is often measured by growth you know, and consumption and GDP. And uh, suddenly faced with the coronavirus right now, we are forced to question whether or not that's the right set of measures. Uh, shouldn't we be looking at some other measures around well-being? Uh, should we be actually pushing people to you know, uh, consume more all the while? Uh, is growth the only measure that actually is sacred? Uh, you know, shouldn't we be moving to a society where perhaps we should be consuming less and growth is not the magic mantra to work for? Uh, you know, as we have seen more increased automation and that will keep on increasing with the progress of AI, uh, will we actually need that many people to do so many jobs? And a lot of jobs can perhaps be automated away. And then the question is, what happens with all the people? You know, uh, you know, do they actually keep on working in uh, jobs that don't necessarily make the full, you know, not meaningful? Or do we, in fact, encourage other other kinds of uh, human investment of time and support them by universal income schemes? You know, the whole. Uh, you know, the U.S., what they're doing right now, the government has started to give handouts, is something which is very, very new for the recent history of the U.S. You know, the U.S. traditionally has been against the universal income kind of policies. But uh, this kind of a handouts is something which uh, the government is, is, is doing right now to stir and support, you know, the poorer section of society to be able to consume. Uh, so I think it raises interesting questions about how we organize uh, our society, what the purpose is, and what kind of measures we use uh, for deciding uh, what do we reward and what do we in fact uh, penalize. And uh, I think we will need some kind of um, experiments, come some bold, uh, let's say, uh, thinking on this, on these uh, kinds of questions. You know, strangely, 
if you just flip the other side of the coin and you say that, well, yes, you're required to stay at home, but many organizations are also asking you to work from home. Uh, like, you know, at least in our profession, education, we are lucky enough to be able to do that is not possible in every profession. But, you know, I'm teaching from home and I'm, you know, doing pretty much uh, my normal life from home, I would say close to 80% normal. Uh, because a lot of the work is knowledge work can be done uh, through remote means or through independent work. Uh, so does it actually mean that the nature of work changes? Uh, does it actually mean that uh, the way we organize ourselves changes? Uh, if you don't actually need, uh, you know, so many teachers to be coming to campus every day or so many students to be coming to campus every day, do you need less infrastructure in a, in a, in a school? Uh, maybe you have to invest less to, less in, uh, in, the, in the capital infrastructure and make investment in something else. So I think there are all kinds of questions being asked out here. Uh, I was talking to an executive the other day and they're talking about how even if you have a recovery, so let's say every, everyone hopes for a quick recovery in the fall, and let's assume people come back in the fall to work, but let's assume that uh, the government still, because the virus will still be around, imposes or people, because of their own choice, want to maintain a social distance. This whole notion of social distancing has become you know, very important, uh, something that is becoming quite prevalent. So if you cannot actually put people that close by next to each other in you know, an office environment, what's the capacity you know, of uh, people that you can handle in an office environment? Uh, maybe you need to rethink your, your schedule of working and only you know, half the people come certain time, another half come in a different schedule or every other week or some kind of different alternate mechanisms of you know, looking at your workforce uh, presence on campus or on the, or on the premises. So I think uh, a lot of open questions remain around uh, how we organize ourselves, how we conduct work in the future. And one of the positive things for this uh, whole you know, COVID uh, sort of stay at home movement is for the first time, I think, you know, there has been a forced movement towards accelerating digitalization of the entire economy. Uh, people are being forced to work from home, uh, consume from home. And I think what we will see is an acceleration, the digitization of different sectors. Uh, people will be forced to think about how to do it better and think about ways to make it functional for people in a different kind of a setting. And I think that'll be good for all of us in some sense, because uh, it will in fact, uh, you know, uh, increase uh, the access of many kind of products and services and perhaps efficiency of many other products and services. So it seems that um, another question when listening to you and, and based on things that I've read also, uh, another thing that is important and maybe happening is the questioning of, of the dominance of, of, of markets. And, and just valuing things that you know can be by, bought by by money, so the the dominant uh, trend in the past forty years has been to give you know it's the capitalist system, so it's all driven by by markets, and is this the best way of running the economy? Mm -hmm. In fact, we have seen public systems being dismantled, uh, putting a lot of pressure to marketize, so to speak, to be run like businesses, and they had to make money and so forth sometimes at the expense of the public good, whatever, you know, however you want to define the public good. But uh, it's, it's clear that, you know, in, in some countries <clears throat> like, like the US, you, you go to zero hour contracts, the gig economy, et cetera, et cetera. In, in Europe, traditionally, we have been, you know, better protected in this thing that seemed to be, let's say, not so well seen from a US perspective. Now it seems to be the things that are, giving social protection to people in, in when, when it's needed. Today, I heard, and you must have heard, the astounding figure of 6.6 .6 million filing in the US for unemployment benefits, a figure which is like 10 times bigger than what it was just before the crisis. You know, many people are completely unprotected. So I think that COVID-19 may be reversing that trend and perhaps the, the, the state capitalism that we have seen as the major dominant force, at least in the Western societies, may be under serious questioning. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I think you know, there is a, 
general questioning of the balance between state and market that is, you know, has been there for a long time. Certainly you have economies like America who are more on the market side, economy like China more on the state side. And there's always a question about the balance between the two. Um, this crisis is certainly showing the cracks of the market system as have some of the previous crises and it'll force us to rethink some of the elements and already you're seeing a move towards nationalization you know, of industries, of companies in both America and Europe. Uh, whether it's a nationalization the temporary or long-term that remains to be seen, but there is increasing call for governments to play a role in not just uh, you know, securing key industries and saving jobs, but also ensuring the public health infrastructure uh, and this is something that we have seen in many sectors, you know, even before the crisis, uh, if you think about telecoms, uh, there has been a major issue with privatization telecoms in some countries. And at the same time, how to keep investing in telecoms infrastructure, you need some kind of capital, sorry, you need some kind of state support. Otherwise, the private sector does not necessarily make the right investments uniformly across the country. If you think of telecoms as the basic infrastructure required for everyone to live. So what you start seeing is that the role of the state certainly is going to get uh, strengthened, most likely. Uh, I think um, what we'll start seeing is people will uh, start accepting and start also questioning the how we can address some of the failures of the market system. There's a lot of talk in recent years about the new capitalism, how capitalism has failed in our know, inclusive growth and environment and multi-stakeholder approaches in, in different, different ways. And so I think people will start talking about these kinds of issues, these forces will get more, more momentum in the, in, the, in the coming years. And I think on the whole, uh, this will require some strong leadership because if we don't have leadership or leadership in fact goes the opposite direction, uh, a lot of things can actually get, uh, you know, uh, slowed down in some sense, you know, and we are seeing some of the challenges on the climate side. Uh, and on the climate side, uh, you know, we haven't necessarily made progress in the last few years, and that's not something we can be proud of. Let's talk about business. We are a business school. I think we've been talking a little bit about the macro, the economy, governments. Let's go down to the mezzo level, I mean, economy. Uh, what can companies, what should the companies be doing? And I think there are two aspects here. One is a social aspect, and one is the, the, the pure managing of, of, of the business, of the organization itself. Um, how do you see them balancing the different needs of the different stakeholders in, in moving forward? So, you know, like you, you know, I've been talking to many business executives and business leaders. In fact, just two hours ago, I was on a call with a CEO of a company. And this company, he told me directly, you know, that 95% of his revenues are at risk right now. 95%, that high. In many companies, it's not that high, but clearly what you see is that a large chunk of the revenues is at risk for almost every business. Uh, even in business schools, you know, it's not clear completely uh, what proportion of the students who have signed up for the MBA program will delay their admission by another year. Uh, what proportion of executive MBA students will no, no, no longer be able to come to programs because their companies don't, don't have the money to pay for it necessarily. So I think there is a crisis that is pretty widespread uh, so what I see is uh, there's a first and first reaction right now clearly is to balance the need to cut costs while looking after workers as best as possible. So I think companies are more aware about the need to sort of manage welfare and well-being of employees. But of course, you cannot do it for everyone equally to the same degree. So companies are trying to find a run a fine balance between you know, doing the right things for employees, for as many of them as possible, while, of course, cutting costs. Because if you don't cut costs, you know, you're, go you're going to be dead most likely, uh, or at least be hurt quite, quite strongly. Uh, then there is a very important um, issue in terms of uh, restarting business, because many companies' business has pretty much halted or in, at least has got a big hit. And how do you restart business where the consumer confidence may not be completely strong? So how do you build trust in the key stakeholder groups, including, including customers, so that you will restart uh, the business once the crisis you know, disappears? And then I think there is a very important question of you know, how does your business model change? 
uh, or in a sense, do you need to change your business model uh, for the future? For me, the biggest opportunity right now for everyone is to ask those hard questions. Uh, you know, as one uh, CEO told me, he told me, well, look, you know, I have told my executive team that you worry about 2020. Okay, we have crisis management. We have a lot of, you know, painful decisions to make. You worry about them. We know in some sense what is to be done right now. I will worry about 2021. Okay, where should we actually go and, you know, what, what should we do? I mean, the basic sense is trying to say is that the current management needs to handle the current crisis. And... If you think of crisis management, you know, one of the first rules of crisis management is be transparent and give the truth as you know, bluntly as possible. Yeah. So I think it's also important for business leaders right now to give the facts, you know, however hard it, they might be, uh, not to sugarcoat them, and then engage the people as much as best as possible in trying to overcome the difficult situation we all are facing right now. So it's a, I think it's a real test for leaders. And so, you know, it's great to have you, Ramon, leading the Porto Business School. And I think you're a great leader, but also other people, you know, in the same similar positions. I think it's a great test of leadership because you have to navigate the current challenges at the same time, imagine the future. And uh, imagine the future in a highly digitized world may in fact be quite different. So I think, it, you know, on the positive side, it gives an opportunity to leapfrog. A change process that would have taken probably years, you can maybe push it through now in months. And that, I think, is the opportunity for all business leaders. Yep. Obviously, the future is not what it used to be. I know it sounds like a cliche. We've seen that. We've said that before. But I think it is, you know, it is a moment in which is very true. It's, it's now. And, and you're right. We have to think not about 2020, but at 21 and beyond. And, and here maybe there, there is one aspect I wanted to ask you. I mean, you've been for many years in the sector of technology and IT in particular. How do you see, you know, today we are doing this via, you know, teleconferencing and clearly all companies are using that to an extent that they couldn't even Im be imagining some, some, some weeks ago. Um, what, if anything, of these changes will, you know, prevail for the future and at the same time how do you see the business models then being affected by technology and by the way we can talk about another thing which we started talking about which is globalization and what does all these changes mean for globalization are the global supply chains that we have been used to in the past going to be disappearing and now we're going to be near shore sourcing and producing closer to the consumer instead of looking for the cheaper far away alternative Two questions, I suppose, these are. Right? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, the global supply chain, just to look at the second issue first, I think is a, is a very good case in point because in, in, in management and business, we have fine-tuned global supply chains, you know, to take advantage of the most competitive resourcing of uh, products and raw materials and competencies in different parts of the world. Uh, we've implemented just-in-time, you know, techniques to make sure that they all are actually functioning with... Uh, incredible uh, seamless integration and on-time delivery. And now suddenly you see all of that being called into question. Uh, so I think what you will start seeing is um, the global supply chains are going to be rethought. And that rethinking is going to happen also partially because of this so-called pressures of decoupling of the US and China. Uh, so far, China has been a very important node in the global supply chains. China has developed an awesome capability in both manufacturing, logistics, and everything else. And if China is not meant to be the only sort of strong node in the global supply chain, we have to rethink, you know, how that actually structured on a national, on an international basis, whether there's nearshoring or finding alternate means is, is important. Uh, you'll also find technologies evolving and changing. So now, for example, uh, you know, 3D manufacturing is becoming more real. You know, five years ago, it was more niche application. Today, you can actually build with 3D manufacturing small homes, and it'll become more and more feasible to build a car or build other kinds of vehicles, other kinds of products with 3D manufacturing. And with 3D manufacturing, you don't necessarily need the kind of heavy infrastructure, and, you know, you can do it much more closer to uh, location. And manufacturing becomes from a physical process to a more software-driven process. So what I'm just trying to say is that 
the global supply chain will change because of both political issues and also uh, technology progress, which is really driving that kind of change. Uh, for business schools and business, you know, uh, what we find, I think clearly the model has to be rethought. Uh, digital is going to be a very important part of uh, the future. You know, traditionally in business schools or in universities in general, we have been very slow to change. So, you know, we use technology, I would say, 10% of what the potential is, uh, especially on the learning side. Um, so I think, you know, we still prefer and we opt for the traditional face-to-face -face model. Now, I'm not saying the face-to-face -face model will go away. No, it'll still stay. But I think it'll be a blended model. Uh, think of Amazon as an example. And Amazon, of course, came from the digital side. But today, it is actually having a whole network of physical stores, too. And that, I think, will become stronger in the future. Because Amazon, you know, is investing in the blended model. Alibaba has the same blended model. So having a blended model, uh, having a model that questions, you know, do we actually need people to come for a four-year degree or a two-year degree? You know, do we, can, can we not provide just-in-time learning in small bits and bytes? Uh, so I think, that, you know, if you think of what universities do, we do three things. So we give knowledge, we assess the knowledge, and we provide certification. And today, traditionally, we do all three, you know, so universities, they have the faculty who give the knowledge, they have the faculty who assess it and give exams, and they also certify with their label. If you just think of a different model in which you break down those three things, you actually say, well, knowledge can come from anywhere, it can come from my faculty, it can come from faculty elsewhere, digitally, it doesn't matter how it comes, but knowledge is a much broader thing. Assessment you know, who needs to do assessment, maybe the different ways of doing assessment, the companies that do assessment very well, you know, like GMAC, you know, they do assessment of, you know, competence in a certain area professionally. Maybe you can do assessment in a different way. Uh, certification, of course, the brand is very important. Certification is something that uh, linked to the brand. So if you think about breaking these three things apart, uh, you might have very different configurations of learning models that come up. And I was talking to the dean of uh, a university called the Western Governors University, the dean Rashmi. Uh, basically is doing a lot of these innovations you know he's saying well you know why don't why do we actually have to structure knowledge in a certain specific way why don't we open it up and have markets you know of faculty markets of you know competency assessment and essentially do the certification in a different way so i think you'll have different kind of models coming up and digital is going to accelerate uh, some of these changes i'm glad to hear all these things but it's obvious that you're no longer a dean Deans also have to care about accreditations. And unfortunately, if there is an institution that probably moves slower than universities are the accrediting agencies. But anyway, this is a job. No, but that's the same issue of regulation. Yeah. 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 The same issue of regulation. Regulation is, you know, is now in the healthcare, you see regulation. They want to try out new vaccines. They want to try out new things. You know, regulation in the FDA in the U.S. is in a slow. Yeah. And then the government is putting pressure on the FDA to do things faster. So I think you will see the kind of change. Regulators also have to change. So I'm sure ACS, the other regulators, you know, they'll also change. But that's a healthy part of the process. This has to happen with the collective. Uh, in, in all fairness, I am, I am, I am part of EFMD in a, in, a, in a task force to uh, study this issue of uh, digitalization anyway. So we, we are making some progress in that direction as well. But I'm, as you said, we, are, we tend to be very slow to, to change. But as, as you all know, um, necessity is the mother of all innovations. And what we have seen is a huge necessity now in this short period of time with COVID. We had to move to online in a very short period of time. As you said, we would have never been, and we, like us, many other institutions, of course. Uh, but the point that you made about, you know, do people prefer face-to-face -face or, 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 you know, or online? There's still a big debate. Uh, for undergraduate programs, it's one thing, but for executives that they prefer the, the, the networking and, and the face-to-face -face interaction both with them among themselves and the faculty, that of course, it's, it's, a, it's a different question. So, but as you said, it's probably the future is blended and try to decompose and look creatively and, 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 and with an open mind, how we can move forward and take advantage of what technology uh, brings. So um, I'm just looking at the time. Uh, at some point, we should open up also for questions from, from the audience. Uh, I'm sure we could 
continue. Uh, I do not know if you want to add something else. We talk about the government, we talk about business, we talk about business schools. Of course, the other thing is the rest of us, society and how we will, but in a way we talk a little bit about this when we talk about government, right? So I do not know if you want to add any other thoughts about changes that you may see in society moving forward before I open it up to, to the audience. No, I think, you know, what we are seeing in, in societal issues is uh, how technology is both, you know, sort of separating us at the same time, also bringing us together. Because, uh, you know, the common complaint I heard about technology and societal point of view was how, you know, kids were always in the phones and everyone was, you know, sort of chatting away and typing away in their own micro worlds. And now what you're seeing is technology is becoming the way in which families connect with each other or in which friends get together. And I'm seeing things happen which uh, people did not do before, you know, like uh, uh, one family member uh, is collecting together her friends, you know, from uh, different years. And every Sunday they have a one hour Zoom session to talk about different things. Now, this is something which they did not do before. Uh, but somehow the trigger has come now to say, okay, we are, you know, sort of stuck a little bit in different locations, unless I can get together virtually. So I think you're seeing this thing about how people are coming together using technology. And I think that is creating more also of a shared humanity. So I actually have uh, a more positive view about how technology is going to impact society going forward is that somehow it's helping us to rediscover our common bonds, our common values. And, you know, when you see people in Spain and Italy or whatever, you know, uh, clapping for the people, you know, the frontline medical workers every p.m. at 8 p.m. or doing other kinds of, you know, social activities like singing and, you know, and playing across balconies. I think what you're seeing is uh, people are suddenly uh, being forced to face the fact that we are human beings and we need to connect to other human beings and technology is an enabler of that. And I think we will see really a positive blending of technology and face-to-face -face, uh, in our lives in the future. This is my hope and my wish. One, one, one of the things that we have seen in countries like Denmark and to some extent the UK and other countries that at this point are trying to help people even with, and even in the US it has happened, that they send people income okay so if you don't work and you have to stay at home and we're telling you to stay at home maybe we're trying to compensate you somehow so i know that and that leads links back to the question of artificial intelligence that you talk about and, and robots working and so forth if in the end there's going to be less space for our own work um there are people who defend that today we have to work to earn an income but if we don't have to work in the future because there are other ways of getting things done, we should we still need an income to buy things. Right. So that's a very intriguing societal question. How do you, I mean, I'm sure that in your artificial intelligent groups, you must be discussing this type of things, right? So No, I think it raises the issue of, you know, universal income, the nature and purpose of jobs and livelihood. Uh, if you look at the developed economies, uh, the number of hours people spend on leisure has been going up over the years. So mm -hmm. clearly, with increased automation and change policies you know, and more social friendly policies, the number of hours of leisure has gone up every year. So this case of working at home may be a little bit more extreme case. Working at home is not leisure completely, but at least it raises the issue in terms of you cannot actually consume some things. And some industries have really got shut down, you know, in a pretty big way, like tourism or retail and so on. So the question really is, what do we expect from people in society? And how do we expect them to have a sense of dignity? Because ultimately, you know, what a job gives you is not just money to survive. A job gives you also dignity, a sense of self-respect, a sense of, you know, uh, contributing, a sense of being, you know, the best person you can be. And uh, today what you're seeing is uh, the questions being raised about, you know, if we don't need so many people to do so many jobs, maybe universal income is the way to go. Uh, universal income is an unproven concept as of now. You know, the results on that are not completely conclusive in terms of it's good or bad. But maybe we have to find a way to implement it properly. 
we have to probably have a better social you know, network to support people. Uh, Europe certainly has done a much better job on that than America, but uh, social networks and other kinds of uh, sort of government supported structures are ways in which we can perhaps direct the attention and energy of people to other things, uh, maybe helping each other, uh, maybe helping the environment, uh, maybe helping animals. You know, I'm just, I don't know what the right answer out here is, but the different ways in which we can uh, direct the goodwill and the energy of people in society and not just only towards economic production and consumption. Yes, in fact, this is a, this is a very good uh, question. I mean, I, I was reading uh, recently that, um, you know, one of the things that this is also, uh, this um, crisis is highlighting is the fact that there are jobs that now we need, like people in the healthcare, you know, at all levels, not just the doctors, but anybody. And, many, and we don't have enough people because these are not well-paid jobs right. and people move to do other things in, you know, society. Don't talk about specific skills, but if you look at society, you know, people go where there is more, 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 you know, money, of course, uh, in, in services, in, in financial services, advisors, whatever. And, and, and yet you have all these so-called pointless jobs. And yet now it, all of a sudden we realize, wait a minute, we actually need all these people. So th there is also, I do not know if that will help us. And I begin to see some, some questions here and, and maybe that can link with one of the questions that I am seeing here, which is, can some of these changes pave the way for a more humane economy, which is more or less what I was trying to, you know, uh, go to with my question? No, I think uh, that's why I said I'm, I'm positive in the sense that, uh, optimistic in the sense that these changes will force us to question our humanity and our core values and connect to them better. Uh, just the fact, I'm just giving you a simple fact of being forced to be at home, and I use the word forced because of circumstances, uh, with your partner, with your family members, you know, and be at home pretty much all the while without the option of going out and disappearing and escaping, forces you to ask the question of your connections to them. You know, it's not a question of just also relationship, it's a question of how does the family unit operate? How do the family members integrate? How do they care for each other? And there's not a one-day phenomena. Oh, there's a three-week phenomena and maybe longer. So the question is, you know, this is an interesting thing in which, which you're forced to question. And I think some other questioning is happening at a societal level too. And that's the reason why I'm optimistic. Now, clearly, there are also negative sides to it sometimes. You know, in the case of abuse and so on, there's some negative sides to this forced uh, sort of uh, cohabitation. But by and large, I think there is a positive side of being forced to question, you know, who you are and how you connect and, you know, what you do and uh, taking the right decisions based on that. I think it, for, for many of us, it's been a wake up call in, in many aspects. I mean, like you, I'm, I'm a person who's traveled a lot all his life and, you know, left family behind while working, you know, at, at a distance, <laughs> I mean, physically at a distance. And, and, and now that you're together, so, you know, it's, uh, it's different, of course. And, and, and you appreciate those moments. I, I, I am with you on, on that. At the same time, I was reading yesterday that the rate of divorces in, in Wuhan, I mean, in China in general, now that they're coming out of the, of the crisis, so there is something to be said about, you know, being forced for too long. <laughs> I don't know if, if there is a downside. No, but apparently you know, there's there is. always two sides of the equation, no question about it. But I think on the whole, I think it's more healthy to ask the questions than not to ask the questions. Of course. And then asking the question, you can decide what you want to do. That's a different story. But I think to ask the question is a positive sign. There's a question uh, speaking of, of this coming from the chat uh, box here about uh, about MBA students and, and if uh, this will also change the type of skills that MBA graduates have to have. We talk about hard and soft skills and, and which are the set of skills that they should invest at this moment. The 2021 class, <clears throat> what sort of skills you would like them to have? Yeah, that's, you know, one of the questions which uh, is a perennial question to a business school dean. And honestly, you know, I don't think the answer to that has changed a lot. 
because to be a good to be a good leader okay there are two or three things that i think are required to be a good leader of course you have to have some basic skills you know if you don't know what uh, npv is you know then you have a problem and then talking if you don't even understand a you know, balance sheet you have a problem so those basic skills have to be there but the basic skills don't get you to the next level uh, clearly you need to be able to have that kind of you know the eq skills and the empathy of people and to lead people and, and leading people is essential because you cannot lead people the soft skills become very critical but the third thing that I think is very important is uh, in leadership, very critical is to be able to ask the right questions. Uh, you may not be able, you may not have the right answers. No one expects someone to have the right answers. But at least if you're able to look ahead and ask the right questions, maybe you have a better chance of finding the better answers or rallying your people to be able to go in the right direction. So the more you can engage people, uh, ask the right questions. I think that's what makes it successful. So in terms of skills, yeah, certainly, you know, make sure you cover all the MBA basics, uh, develop your soft skills as best as possible, but at the same time, be bold enough to ask the questions about the future. And this is a good time to ask the question of the future. Well, excellent. We're getting close to our final time. I'm not sure that I see many more questions coming, but, um, you know, uh, perhaps as a closing statement, I, I think that um, COVID has really highlighted many deficiencies in, in, our, in our existing system. So and, and an effective response is likely to require radical societal change. I think that's part of the conclusions that we are uh, coming up with today. Um, one last question i said okay one last question it's coming here so i let me give you will this crisis accelerate transformation in executive education will this be the definite triumph of online well i think to some extent we talk about this but as i said executive education is different than education in general and you know that because you've been dean of executive education at INSEAD, so which you have a lot of experience behind your back so it is an interesting dilemma right so the the need for face-to-face -face interaction and networking vis-a-vis -vis things that, as you said, eventually can be done online as well. No, so I think, you know, the need for um, executive education increases, and that's been increasing because the rate of change of knowledge is very high right now. Uh, the complexity of business is very high. To get things done, you have to coordinate and, you know, and different groups of people. Uh, often, you know, collaborate with competitors and all the kind of complexities in business. So I think uh, what you find is um, executive education needs to become much more agile, much more on demand, much more real time, uh, and will need to be delivered, of course, through a combination of in-person and face-to-face. -face. I think the world in every way will be blended. Uh, blended is the future and, 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 the, and the way forward. I think we are being blended as we speak, aren't we? <laughs> so anyway, so let me just uh, conclude. Well, I was just saying that clearly uh, this conversation has pointed out that there are deficiencies in our system and, and moving forward, we probably will need the radical social change. Uh, probably a drastic move away from markets as we discussed and the use of profits as the primary way of organizing the economy. And as some of one of the speakers, uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the questions asked here, the upside is probably the possibility that we now have to reflect on all this and to build a more humane system, a more humane society that leaves us, on the one hand, more resilient in the face of pandemics, pandemics for the future and other impending crises like the one you mentioned, which is climate change, which we you know, have it on us already for quite some time and we haven't made the progress that we should do. Ironically, as we have seen, in those wonderful maps from China and now in Europe, the air is much more cleaner than it used to be because of the lockdown, which it's an interesting outcome of, of, this, of this crisis. So um, all these changes will have to come from many places and for many influences. And, and uh, maybe I think the task for all of us is that we probably need to demand some of these emerging uh, social forms. And, and, and we need to have a, a code of ethics and, and, and and values that 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 uh, you know care that's about around care, life, and and 
and democracy in, in, in a good way, right? We don't want, as you said, the state, we, we have to put also some, some, how should I say, barriers as to what the state can do. I mean, it's good to, that they take some things, but it may go to the extreme as, as we have seen in totalitarian uh, uh, regimes. So um, let's make sure that we, uh, our politicians, uh, will take advantage of this crisis as well. And if not, we as citizens, we should be demanding that and we should live and organize around those values. Uh, so thank you, Sumitra, for this uh, interesting conversation and this exchange of views. And I hope to see you again in other activities that we organize here at our school. And thank you, you all viewers, for joining us today. And, and remember that every week, PBS hosts webinars uh, beyond now on Tuesdays and the Dean's Lounge on Thursdays. So goodbye and until soon. Sumitra, the last word. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Ramon. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, you know, stay safe and healthy and also, of course, use this opportunity to shape your future. We will. Thank you very much, Sumitra. Bye-bye.